Hey everybody, Preston Brin here with our weekly roundup. This is our Trader User Group um, review for the week ending April 22nd, 2016. What I've got on the screen here is a weekly chart of the E-mini S&P 500 futures. And I want to take a step back for a minute and let's kind of look at where we've gone, where we've been, where we could possibly go from here. Now, before I do this, just a quick note. Next week is going to be a key week. Uh, we're at a couple of key inflection points for the market. And I believe based on the FOMC, that would be the U.S. Central Bank, the Feds, <coughs> excuse me, the Feds on Wednesday are going to come out with their policy statement. Yellen will not hold a press conference. She only does that at the end of every quarter, unlike other central banks around the, the world. But the odds favor a dovish uh, Fed policy statement. Uh, remember, December last year, the Feds came out, raised the rates 25 basis points. That's a quarter of a percent here in the United States. And the markets proceeded to sell off over 10%, uh, depending on the index, some more than that. And then all of a sudden in February, when the markets were down uh, fairly low, uh, the G20, that'd be the 20 largest countries, um, uh, economically in the world met in Shanghai and uh, what I would call the Shanghai Accord they probably behind the scenes made some agreements to talk some currencies down uh, especially the US dollar which was hurting global growth emerging markets and so forth and then we had the dollar move back we had the all of a sudden on February the 11th we got all the signals I got uh, our members long and we over allocated in the energy market and it turned out to be a great play um, but now we've got another Fed meeting and um, after that Shanghai Accord uh, in February, notice the, the Feds all of a sudden went from, we're going to do four rate hikes in 2016 to, and we might do two or maybe one. The markets are pricing in right now. The 30-day Fed fund futures is pricing in one rate hike for the rest of this year. Now, should the Feds come out this um, uh, Wednesday afternoon, 2 p.m. New York City time, and their policy statement indicates slightly more hawkish view, then um, we're going to see a negative reaction in the markets. Should they come out with a dovish view, which is what the markets expect, we can see a continued grind higher, but just a grind. Um, and we may even get a little bit of a sell-off into that meeting. So um, be very careful. I'm, I'm instructing our members to um, not just start loading up on longs. This is not the place to do it. Um, and we've had some great plays and we've made some really good money in the past eight weeks um, off those February the 11th lows um, and <clears throat> now we're going to sit back and, and start to tighten our stops put some puts in there I had our members putting out some um, taking out some spider puts uh, going out into May um, with the potential I see of more weakness than um, 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 strong bullish action. Now the feds of course could come out Wednesday and just be even more super dovish than the markets expect and then we can explode higher. Take out the highs from uh, last year um, but I, I don't see the odds of that happening but if it does we follow the price action. What I've got on the screen here as I said is a weekly chart of the E-minis uh, and if you look at it really closely you can see here that right in that area there we hit the apex <clears throat> of the lows and then we just we've been moving strong ever since we've just been having this rocket ship up like this um, and if I were to draw a accurate because my my drawing skills are not quite that good but like that that would put a support level right around a 0.236 pullback now 0.236 is not an official fib node but in very strong bull markets are strong upward trends this is a very popular stopping point uh, for the markets, very popular. The first natural FIB level is at 0.382, which puts us down to 15.73. I do believe before we get um, in the next year or so, we're going to have that 20% pullback, which officially defines a uh, bear market. 
Um, and you know, if we make out, if we make new highs, then that just moves up where that 20% level comes into play here. But just to give you guys an idea, if I were to measure uh, a 20% move, you know, in relation to you know how high we've been so far, and just put it from the you know from the peak up here, and come down, it puts us. Um, and I've done this exercise before, uh, but it puts us right around 1700. Okay right in that 1700 um, area there. Uh, it, it's it's um, um, uh, right at 1709.65, give or take just a little bit because I'm not drawing the lines exactly accurate, right? But right in that 1700 area, which is just slightly below the FIB level, that would give us an official bear market. But generally, most bear markets go deeper than 20%. They go about... 30%, 35%, which would see us come down to this 1573 area here, uh, the first FIB node. And then, of course, if I really condense the chart here and I extend it over like this, you know, you, you'll see here that that is right on the uh, 1573, uh, which was the peak in um, 2007 going before we had the big fall, and then the dot-com bubble here. So that, to me, long-term, meaning over the next couple of years, I think the odds of coming back and testing that, and I don't know what would trigger that move uh, in the market. It could be anything. Um, but that would give us, you know, a nice little pullback here. Uh, and if I were to, to just, you know, move this down a little bit and just give you an idea. Uh, that would give us about a 25% pullback. And folks, that is a normal, what I consider a normal pullback in a bear market. When we do get this bear market, I don't think it's going to happen in 2016. The odds go up for 2017. That does um, show us um, just a normal pullback in a bear market. Now look at this pullback right here from 2007. That was a little bit abnormal. It was very rough. But we came all the way down to right about there. Um, and, you know, that pullback there was 58%. All right, so 25% is only not even half of what we pulled back in 2007 and 2008. Not even half, right? A similar pullback back then would take us all the way back down to below a th um, right around 1,200 in the S&P. I don't think, I know that I, well, you, you never know, but I believe a more realistic pullback for us when we do have our our um, our move is going to be right around that 25% level, which takes us here. Now, what am I looking at for the next, because you can't trade a two-year plan, right? I mean, some people do, but it's very difficult to do. But that would be what would not surprise me at all. So let's look at this weekly chart here. As you can see, We've had a nice up move, very strong up move. Um, we're getting into this, um, we've been in this um, box right here uh, for quite some time, okay? We actually entered it in 2014, um, and then we made our peak in the summer of 2015. And then we've just, you know, we've come down and we've pretty much touched the bottom of the box and been up at the top of the box, right? And we stayed up here for almost all of 2015 until the summer, and then boom, we, we came right down, and then we made these lows here, and we tested the bottom of the box, which, by the way, is very close to that level right there, okay? Now we're back up to the top again. We got a tremendous amount of overhead resistance here uh, pushing us down. The only thing that's going to get us higher is a dovish Fed, central banks around making free money uh, and just forcing money into the equity market. Right now in the first quarter, most of the money that came into the U.S., most of the money flow in the U.S. Uh, e e ETFs and, and markets came from Europe. Uh, we had a little bit of an outflow of money from Asian markets uh, from the U.S. back over to Asia. But most of the money came in from Europe. And then we've got record high um, stock reinvestment, <clears throat> dividend, um, uh, stock purchase from U.S. corporations because the interest rates are so cheap. It's a way to engineer the bottom line numbers. You can't engineer, you can't re-engineer top line numbers, but you can bottom line. And then when you've got the cheap money, this is what you get right here. 
but the PE ratios are getting, I think, unsustainable at this level given the current earnings rate. Now, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm more of a technology or, or I follow the technical patterns, but I do look at the fundamentals to make sure that price action supports where we are. And as I've told our members over and over again, there are only two things that support stock prices, right? Um, and and it, it, you, you've got um, the the earnings, which is one. Uh, you got to have the earnings, which really um, uh, drives a good part of it. And then you got interest rates. These are the only two things that matter in the market when it comes to money and where money goes. As interest rates go down, P.E. ratios go up, okay? Because what happens is stock prices go up, and you can go up higher than normal with earnings that basically suck because you've got very low interest rates. When interest rates start going up, it's going to drive P.E. ratios down because um, it's going to uh, money's going to look for competing where areas to put their money, you know, risk versus reward, and it's going to drive P.E. ratios down because the stock price is going to go down. So, and that's just kind of the way the financial markets work. Now, on any given two, three, four, five month period, six month period, you know, you can have anomalies to this, but over a longer term, uh, this is what happens right here. Now, <clears throat> What we've got here is a market that has been in this trading range for quite some time. Now, granted, it's a wide trading range, right? We've got a very wide trading range here. But this box, too, shall be broken. Um, we're either going to break to the upside or to the downside. If we break to the upside, you can blame cheap interest rates and cheap money, all right? Um, very dovish policy, and it doesn't really matter. We'll trade it if it breaks that way. But the odds favor a move back to the downside based on uh, where the natural uh, 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 price to earnings ratio is right now, right? Because um, you get a higher price, meaning a higher stock price based on lowered earnings, and the P.E. ratio just goes up, very natural. So let's look at the technical patterns here and see if we can kind of ascertain something. Uh, the one thing that I would say on this weekly chart, and let me just blow it out just a little bit here like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to draw a line, and you can see this line like this. <coughs> and it is very slight, but it's very deceiving because it's very wide, right? And the wideness in this thing uh, gives people this false hope that you know we're in just a huge bullish market. Uh, yet when we were going down like that, people were saying just the opposite. Man, we're we're in a very bearish market, although it wasn't technically bearish. We haven't fallen greater than twenty percent, so it's just a counter reaction in an overall bullish market, right? So these moves here um, kind of scare the children, especially that move there on August twenty fourth when China devalued the yuan. Um, but be that as it may, we've got a wide path here, but it's unmistakable in that it's just slightly going down. We're making lower highs. Now, let me just draw it on here on this weekly, and then we will come in and we will take a look at a daily chart, and we'll, we'll zoom in just a little bit here. So if I were to come in here, and let me just change my um, drawing tool here, and let's just put it on a trend line. We'll start with a peak there, and I'll just come down like that and touch it like that. Now, <clears throat> And let me do another one here like that. Let me let me um, see if I can't. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's do another one here like that, and just connect these dots like that. Okay, so you can see uh, we're moving down on both, right? I mean, if I if I explode it up, you can see it is it is a very wide. Uh, a very deceiving pattern here that could indicate we're going to work our way back down and explode back up again. Okay, uh, let me just take this off so it doesn't get in the way, but I'm, I'm going to zoom in here on a daily chart here. If we look at a daily chart with that line in there, you can see the pattern here with that green line at the top. Um, we poked our head up above here, right there. We actually moved up for over two days, and then we close back down again. 
uh, and technically we only closed above that line one day and then the very next day we went right back below again you can also see down below um, we've got this this pattern here um, that suggests from that high to that high here just a slight uh, divergence in the MACD which would suggest a little bit of a pullback so that was one of the reasons why I got our members you know when we made these highs up here I was saying okay let's buy some puts here just hold on for a little bit uh, and the timing turned out to be fairly nice for us so you can see here that we're gonna have trouble here the other thing I want to highlight on this screen is you can see this right in that area there um, a lot of volume you can see this blue line these blue lines here that's volume over price so a ton of volume right here right now it's there the sellers are winning uh, on this volume here I mean it's just it, it really sticks all the way out to here I mean there's lower volume down here uh, but just a lot of volume here and you can see right now it's more volume supporting the sellers than the buyers um, it stopped us dead in our tracks here and we rolled over and you can see there was a lot of of buying and selling mostly institutional selling to rat brain traders that wanted to pick up longs in this area here and then they just <laughs> they, they got taken to the woodshed same thing right here we came back up we we made an attempt at highs but you can see we made lower highs from the previous highs here and then again um, folks were taken to the seller right here so now we're back up in this level again and so the question is is the same thing going to happen I can't tell you that but the odds do favor a pullback here okay that's what the odds favor uh, now the other thing that I'm going to show you here is what this is just shows you the wide nature of the choppiness of this range we got one we got two we got three we got four, four fifty over two hundred EMA crosses, right? That cross to the downside, that cross to the upside, that cross to the downside, that cross to the upside. Okay, that again shows you the wide nature from top to bottom of the chop in the market, but it is chop. We're bouncing around. Now you expect to see EMA crosses on short time frame crosses, you know, a, a daily and maybe a shorter time frame, or, or maybe, um, you know, short time frame EMAs. But on a 50 and 200, folks, um, it's been a while since I've seen it happen this much. Generally, it happens like this at bottoms, uh, mostly at tops, not bottoms. Bottoms tend to be one of these kind of rounded bottoms like that and then it moves up and you've got one cross when it moves back up and it stays that way for a while just a very consolidated bottom kind of thing however at tops this is what you see at topping markets you get you know you get across here you get across here you get across here you get across here markets are fighting they're trying to figure out which way they want to go <clears throat> I blame a lot of this on the central friggin' banks. Their, their communication skills are horrible. You know, it's like that Charlie Brown cartoon where the teacher speaks and all you hear is wah, 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 right? Well, we're going to get more of the Charlie Brown teacher this week here. So that's kind of what I see on a very short-term basis here. Um, if we come in and take a look at a two-hour chart, um, you can see right here in this two-hour chart, we were having st uh, uh, steadily progressive uh, uh, bearish divergence here like this and it was just it was just a, a, to me it was a, an easier trade to take taking uh, shorts up in that level that was just an easier one to take right so on this time frame I would not be surprised to see a little bit of a movement up into the Fed and then let's say if the beds come out more hawkish we're going to move down a fake move, a down, and a fake move like that, giving us a channel to the downside. If they come out bullish, or let's say more dovish than expected, then we can expect more of this kind of pattern here, uh, where it's just very choppy, uh, but grinding mostly a little bit higher. But I do believe um, it, we're, we're reaching the apex, given where earnings are right now, where we can go. 
Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, the S&P 500 and just kind of where I'm sitting here right now. Okay, uh, if we look at volatility, volatility is another thing that I've got which really has got me on a watch uh, right now. Volatility, the VIX, um, you know, the VIX moved down pretty good on Friday, it moved down 73 cents, almost one full uh, point. Uh, for those of you that follow uh, in the Greek trades, uh, which would almost be a one point move uh, for the Greeks in Vega. But notice we're in what I call zone one. Zone one is an area where your option strategies change based on what you're trying to accomplish if you're an options trader. Zone one, you've got to be very careful because generally what happens is you generally move from zone one to zone two. There's really not much. It, volatility is more apt to spring up than go down. I think we're going to be quiet in volatility until we get to the Fed and then U.S. GDP, by the way, which hits on Thursday, the day after the policy statement of the FOMC. This is what we're seeing right now in volatility and then we can move back up into zone two, three, four and then black swan events, which, which is what we got last August, <coughs> which takes us up into black. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm looking at right there and we've got a number of different ways to play volatility and we go through it in our member videos and for our meetings. There are a number of stocks that we're watching that I'm pointing out that look like they've been doing very well. Longer term plays. Same thing in the bond market we're watching also. Um, and also in the currency market, same thing in the metals and the silver market. I'm not going to go all through that in this weekend for our members. We're going to spend more time in that this Sunday. Uh, one thing I will point out is oil. Um, we've had a really, remember what I said earlier in this broadcast this weekend. I said on February 11th, we over allocated on oil. We had a beautiful signal uh, and we rode that to the upside in oil and oil futures. Uh, in energy stocks, in smaller energy stocks, and we just we did very well. You can see we're at 2016 highs right now. Um, I do believe the near-term direction for oil is more to the downside than to the upside, a slight weakening. Um, but notice that even with the lack of a production freeze in the meeting in Doha last Sunday, oil still moved up. Now, I go through a lot more uh, detail for our members why that is happening and ways to trade the oil market. So for, for, for all of you out there um, that are not members, I highly encourage you to come in. We get a lot of uh, international players that come in. Uh, and look at, uh, from our membership standpoint, you can sit and look at our chat room or, or uh, the, the Tuesday or Thursday morning live sessions I do with the market or Sunday night. Uh, we've had a very good year for 2016, and I think that's going to continue. And we've got some really cool trades coming up. And if you guys remember, even on this free broadcast, I was saying currencies is going to be where you want to be for 2016. Uh, and we're getting some of the moves, as I talked about, in currencies as well. Same thing with agriculture. One other thing I'll show you on agriculture, our soybean trade just went absolutely crazy, if you guys will recall. Um, for our members, all down in this area here, we were selling puts underneath the market in soybeans, and we just did it four times in a row. I was even, you know, some of our members were even going long soybeans right in this area right here, and you could see what happened. Uh, just a really good move, and you could see it's $50 a, a point, just like the E-mini futures in the soybean trade. Uh, very good trade. We also had what I talked about is a pair trade where we're trading wheat against soybeans and that was just a really interesting move also and you can see this pullback here so there's going to be more trades in the ag market as well so anyway guys that's my update for the weekend I wanted to focus more on the e-minis and what we got coming up this week because it's going to be an interesting week with the feds on Wednesday the soft GDP number that everybody expects on Thursday and then we're not going to hear from the feds for a while so then we're going to be able to free roam with the remaining part of the earnings, which, you know, they beat lowered, I mean, really lowered expectations. But when you look at the numbers, they're still down percentage wise, quarter over quarter, year over year. So it's going to be really interesting where this comes. So if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in, check us out for members. I'll see you guys tomorrow night at our weekly market watch Sunday night at 8 p.m. New York City time. Have a go in everybody. Ciao.